one, two, three, and we're live. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, another week, another podcast. Uh, welcome, David. Hi. So we got we have David. Uh, Bum Gold. There Bum is gold. B- Bum Gold. There yeah. is a gold in your name. Yes, but you can just call me DB. Most of my exactly. Do, I was yeah. doing. I was doing my research, and I was like, "That's just a DB guy." Well, okay, I'm just gonna <laughs> call you DB. People understand uh, what's the watch. <laughs> I like the nickname because it's quicker to say, it's fast to type, and I like the association with databases. Yeah, exactly. And we're gonna talk about databases yeah. in a few minutes, so that's a perfect uh, uh, nickname. So, uh, uh, David, thanks for coming. Mm-hmm. I'm going to introduce David to people uh, listening and watching. Um, D- David is a software engineer. He's a trained software engineer. You're from the US, yep. and um, you've you mentored people like uh, Python and Flask Mm -hmm. uh, 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 in your previous career, I would say. Uh, And uh, you gave tons of talks in the the Python world. And uh, now you live in Amsterdam. That's Uh, right. You mostly do Python and JavaScript as your main uh, stack as as a... Um, uh, as you can, you, you, yeah, those are the information you can find online. But there's something that I didn't find online. Mm -hmm. But... After I met you, when I met you like two weeks ago, um, we talked about this uh, Postgre file, mm-hmm. an open source uh, GraphQL, PostgreSQL um, uh, platform, like a tool, and you contributed to that. Yeah. And that's basically, I'm talking about open source software. Mm-hmm. So you're an OS guy, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm interested to know what is like to be a OS guy and uh, the, the amount of work, the extra amount of work and who's paying for that. So uh, that's, that's interesting. And two things that I discovered while doing my research, you're into hypnotherapy. That's right. Yeah, some people do that. <laughs> and then you're a singer as well. That's you're, right you're, as well. you're part of a, a chorus mm-hmm. here in Amsterdam. So, uh, David, thanks again for joining us. Could you tell us more about you, your story? More if, about me? Yeah, sure. like I already did an intro, but I know that it's better. It's also sometimes just better to have the, my guests explain sure. a bit more. Yeah, so I'm DB. As you said, I'm a software engineer, and I have a wide range, a wide range of other interests as well. Um, I got into computers in college, actually, and that's something that has actually provided a lot of motivation for me because there's a lot of stories of like these whiz kids who have been programming literally ever since they were six years old. That's not me. Uh, okay. You know, I, I never started programming until I went to college, and I started it by accident. Uh, because I had this friend in high school who was into programming and I always thought he was a little weird. But (laughs) then when I went to college, I was looking for a class that would fill a specific time slot in my schedule. And I saw that there was a class called Introduction to Computer Science. And I thought, hey, I wonder what that friend of mine was on all about. I guess I'll check it out. And I discovered that I really liked it. Um, So yeah, I, I went to college at Brandeis University in Massachusetts in the US. And I double majored in computer science and psychology. Uh, People ask me all the time, why those two? I think it's just that I like understanding how things work that you don't necessarily see. So how computers do their thing and how people do their thing doesn't always make sense, but it's very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, And then I started working in the field of computer science right out of college, and I got a job with TripAdvisor.com, bounced around to a couple of other different companies, and eventually decided that I wanted to leave the United States and found Amsterdam, which has been a really great experience for me living here. Um, I took a job with a company called Impraise, and that was my first time working as a JavaScript developer primarily instead of doing Python. I love Python and I love JavaScript. I think they're both great languages, but most of my background, most of my uh, historical development experience has been with Python. And most of what I'm doing lately these days, most of the stuff that I'm interested in right now is with JavaScript. Okay. So they're uh, both near and dear to my heart. So yeah, I was actually saying that uh, it's interesting the, the way you introduce uh, the how you get into, you got into computer science by accident. Uh, like completely bypassing the old myth of like, yeah, you, you're a genius if you went through this, like, oh, I was an early 
mm-hmm. programmer and then that's on the only thing that I wanted to do in my life yeah. and I had a I had a guest a few a few weeks ago she uh, she meant she was talking about this impostor syndrome like um, oh, yes. and, and like yeah at some point everyone has his own path mm-hmm. and then you should just uh w- 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 if you enjoy it, just double down and then keep going. And your raving industry, you're gonna have something to do. The the, the genius people, they also gonna have their thing. At the end of the day, we're all software engineers. So I like. I'm really happy that you did the way you uh, you introduced that. So you mentioned that now you nowadays you're mostly doing JavaScript. You actually touring Amsterdam because I saw you. I met you during a meetup, mm-hmm. but. Probably the week after or the same week, I don't remember. You were on another meetup because they were. I saw the picture online. I was like, "Oh, that's DB over there." That's, so, uh, w- what is your life in in Amsterdam as a software engineer? Because you're a freelance, right? I how's am. how's your life? Uh, well, I mean, the life there? of a freelancer is sometimes difficult to qual- to quantify. Yeah. Um, and right now. I have only one contract which doesn't take up all of my time. It's about 20 hours a week. Um, And I'm earning enough on that contract to cover myself. Not much more, but that's fine. Um, So that means that I have a lot of free time to do other things, to hang out with interesting people, and to sort of live my life the way I want, which is great. Um, But yeah, I want to get more into JavaScript. I want to get more into attending meetups and going to technical events and such. And I need to do more with like applying to speak at conferences and such like that, because I really enjoyed the conference speaking that I've done in the past, but I haven't done any in a while. So I want to see if I can turn that around. Okay. So um, that is... um like when I met you two weeks ago, the, mm-hmm. the, the main we met at a, at the GraphQL meetup. Yep. And um, well, I think we actually met at the Svelte meetup, right? Did we? Yeah. No, that's that's the point. I saw a picture of you at the Svelte meetup, uh-huh. but I wasn't there. Ah, uh, I, I see. I, okay. I'd register, but I canceled my my ten, tenants. There, that's like, what it was. Like a day. Because yeah. I, 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 I wanted to be there. Yeah. I, I just wanted to see what's going on in Amsterdam around this framework, mm-hmm. and I couldn't make it. So yeah. I met you finally at the, at the GraphQL meetup organized by URI. Cool. Um, and we, we talked about uh, uh, post, post-Graphile. Yep. I, I'm, I still have a hard time to pronounce that thing. Post-Graphile. It's even, it's yeah. even written right here. <laughs> uh, post-Graphile. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and, and you Yuri told me actually like yeah that guy uh, contribute to that and then by chance we end up walking from the meetup to the to the metro and we talked about that could, could you could you tell the people listening how you got into the, um like contributing to that and uh what it what it means to be a contributor to an open source uh, sure okay. um so let me start with a little bit of background uh post graph file is Uh, I guess you could describe it as an instant GraphQL API. Um, It's a project that's written in Node.js, and it's designed to connect to a Postgres database. And when it starts up, it first runs some introspective queries to find out just which tables are in this database, how are they linked together, let me figure out the shape of this database. And then as soon as it has that information, it automatically generates a full GraphQL API that reflects the data that's in the database, which means that all the work that you normally need to do to, to write your own backend to your application, you no longer need to do that. It eliminates a whole step of the development process, which that's I think amazing. is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it does mean you have to design your database in a very specific way, but to be honest, you have to des- design your database in a specific way normally as well. So it's just codifying those good practices. Uh, So I found PostGraphile because I was curious about learning more with GraphQL. And I had heard about this project called Postgres, uh, which is a similar sort of thing, but it's designed for REST. uh, It's a a project that will introspect your database and generate a REST API for you based on the structure of the data. There there was another one called SubZero or something like that? I haven't heard of that one, but I can believe it. You know, this is a very powerful and very appealing idea for a lot of engineers. I wouldn't be surprised if there are multiple implementations of the same idea. And that's fine. That's a good thing in the open source community. Yeah. Um, But either way, I found out about 
Postgrest, and then I heard somewhere on the internet, it might have been on Hacker News or something, that someone had taken this idea and re-implemented it for uh, for GraphQL. GraphQL, yeah. Um, and uh, they called the project PostGraphile. I think it's because the the file uh, suffix in Latin languages means like to love something. Okay. Uh, so like a xenophobe is someone who hates other people. A xenophile is someone who loves, loves other people. It. Yeah. Okay. So PostGraphile is you know loving graphs with a Postgres <laughs> database. It's a bit of a pun. That's a nice way of putting it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did not create this project. Uh, the primary maintainer of the project right now is a really nice guy named Benji Gillum. Yeah. Um, I've met him in person a couple of times and he and I keep in touch over Discord and you know work on the project together. He's as I said the primary guy. He knows everything there is to know about this project. I've just been sort of dipping my toe in and getting more familiar with it and starting to contribute a couple of features. Uh, I've done open source development for I think my entire professional career. Wow. I think that was one of the ways that I started learning computer science was through using open source projects as a way of learning best practices around code. Um, so for me, it was very familiar and not too difficult to get started with contributing. And I did so because there's this project idea that I've had banging around my head for literally years. And I think it would be a really good fit for a GraphQL API, but I've tried building this API using standard tools in the past, and it's quickly spiraled into a maintainability nightmare for myself. Yeah. So I'm really hoping that I can use PostGraphile to simply eliminate the backend code entirely and instead focus on the front end. But it was missing a couple of features that I needed. So I've been trying to learn how to write those features into the project and contribute, and contribute them back so that not only I can use them, but everyone who's using this project can also use those features as well. Okay, and uh, and then you went on and then start building that, those features and then they got accepted as part of the main project. Well, it's never a fast process. Yeah. You know, I had to talk with the people who knew the project better than I did and ask if this was a good idea, what was the best way to implement it. And then once I had a good idea of the structure, then I had to write the code, get it reviewed. And of course, the people who are working on open source, everyone has other things to do with their time. Yeah. Open source is usually unpaid. And so it usually takes a while to get the feedback that you're looking for. So it was a process getting yeah. this stuff done. and. All the details of what I'm looking for are still not merged, but I think we're getting very close. Okay, so interesting. So th there is a, there are a few points there that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, open source, uh, not paid, <laughs> uh, meaning people are doing work for free, in a way. In a uh, way, yes. Um, and uh, so I, I saw that the, the main maintainer of PostgreSQL uh, has these kind words for sponsors each time because he now he, he was able to free up a few days per week mm -hmm. to work actually full time on it which is amazing yeah uh, but how is it to to work to commit that free time because once again on, in your case it's perfect because you you needed the thing mm -hmm. you contributed to that but then once it's there you you're involved you're not anymore just the feature you needed yeah. but you're much more involved mm -hmm. so how is it for you to put more time into that that th those project even when it's not related to your project well what I like to uh, remind people about open source development is that 90% of the time it's all volunteer it's all volunteer driven which means that it's perfectly okay to just work on the things that you're interested in working on and once you're no longer interested in those things it's also okay to step back okay. and let someone else handle the project as well in a perfect world I think it would be that people would scratch their own itch as I call it, you know, work on the project that is interesting for you, um, push it as far as you want it to go, and then step back or maybe act as a mentor for other people who want to scratch their own itch with this project and push it forward. Okay. You know, it's open source development should not be about feeling obligated to work on it or feeling like you have to do a certain thing. Ideally, it should be a community. It should be a group of people who are coming together for a common purpose because they want the world to be better in some yeah. way. And, you know, 
fixing code isn't always the most direct way of improving the world, but you know what? If I can improve this Postgres file project and make it easier for someone, someone, for someone out there to spin up an API that's, you know, crucial for saving people from earthquakes or tsunamis or something like that, yeah. then I feel like I've done a good job, you know? Yeah, even you if I don't know when that's going to happen or even if it's going to happen, making it easier for someone else out there in the world to hack on a project of their own might end up making it more possible for them to build something important. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting take. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, yeah, so, Obviously, people working on on an open source project, they might not have this idea of like I'm doing it to to change the world. I'm mm -hmm. probably doing it to improve um, the landscape of this this set of technologies, which is already a good step. But yeah, sure. I mean, uh, again, you scratch your own itch. You mm -hmm. don't necessarily work on open source with the explicit goal of saying I'm going to build something that someone else is going to use to change the world. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do it because there's something that I want done. I want a specific tool to work in a specific way. And yeah. I know that it's going to take a lot of effort for me to build that. Okay. But I know that it's going to take comparatively little effort for me to take that tool that I've built and release it to everyone else in the world. Nice. That's a pretty easy thing to do. And it's really beneficial for a lot of people out there. So why wouldn't I do that? Okay, interesting. Let me go back to the graph, uh, uh, PostgreSQL file uh, as, a, as a tool. So... Um, to me, it's an appealing idea mm -hmm. of just uh, uh, having a tool that reads your data, your DB, mm -hmm. DB, exactly, <laughs> and then um, create this GraphQL API mm -hmm. uh, on the fly. Um, but I'm like, when I see the landscape of um, GraphQL, um, the, the GraphQL landscape, I'm, I was wondering why there were no company like not an open source uh, group of people, but like a company doing that, like and then making it as like, a paid product and stuff like that. Because oh, I feel is. like there, there is. There absolutely is. Uh, it's, uh, a, it's a very well-known company uh, called Prisma. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> you you know it. I had it. Is there 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 product is a paid product? Because I thought it was still open source, but they will provide you. All, this, the, all the hosting and stuff like that, that's I, the paid part. I think you're correct, yeah. I think their fundamental offering is open source. Okay. And they do that for a very good reason. They do that because open source software is very popular these days, and it gets mm. you a lot of positive sentiment from developers. Mm. Uh, a lot of developers don't really want to touch a new technology that is proprietary and closed source because they don't know if it's going to be around in five years. Yeah. Uh, but with open source technology, at least you know that even if the company company that's sponsoring it uh, goes bankrupt, the software and the code is still available free to use, yeah. which is nice. So I think Prisma started out with making their code open source as a play to try to get more people interested in yeah. using their software and their technology with the ultimate goal of being once people are interested, once they sort of take that first step, then they'll be much more inclined to go on to the paid offerings as yeah. well. I mean, that's typically known as a freemium model where you provide the base level functionality for free and yeah. you expect you hope that some small percentage of those free users are going to convert to paid users. It's a good way of running a business. Yeah. So yeah, you have a, a Azura as well on the on the market, but it's still it's also open source. Yeah. And, um, would you so, uh, in, for, in the fundamental way, how would you compare them then in term of the like uh, uh, the mission they want to accomplish? Sure. Uh, so I should start by saying that I have not used Hazura or Prisma at all. Okay. And I've only used PostGraphile a little bit and only as a hobby user. Okay. I've never run any of these projects in production. So there's going to be a lot of sort of production style questions that I just don't know the answer okay. to. Okay. Okay. But what I can tell you from the perspective that I have of these three projects is that Prisma is sort of the the hulking behemoth heavyweights in this area. Yeah. Uh, they have a large company that is venture-backed behind them. They are spending a lot of money on advertising. They sponsor conferences. They have this glitzy blog. And they do a lot of good stuff for advertising. 
And they do that very intentionally because of what I was talking about with the freemium model. Mm -hmm. They want to get a tremendous number of free users in the hopes that some percentage of those will convert to paid. And the larger your free user base, the larger number of paid users you get mm -hmm. out of that percentage conversion. Yeah. Um, however, after talking with some of the people who are actually looking at the code behind Prisma and behind Hazura and PostgraphQL, the impression that I've gotten is that the Prisma people are more focused on advertising than they are on building a quality product, quality, yeah. which is unfortunate in my opinion. And the latest version of their product even sort of moves a little bit away from GraphQL. Um, there is a, graph, a GraphQL definition language that defines the structure of your types and how right. it should all be laid out. And Prisma has decided that apparently that's not expressive enough. And now they've developed their own sort of proprietary custom language that you use for describing how to describe your, your, graph file, <laughs> your GraphQL project. It's, it's very strange. And as I said, I haven't used it myself. Maybe it works better than I think. But the impression that I've gotten is they're sort of doing a whole bunch of weird uh, custom stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense with GraphQL. Okay. Um, so that's my take on Prisma. Yeah. With again the the caveat that I've never actually used it. Yeah. Um, Hazura and PostgraphQL are much more similar. Um, both of them are also open source, but also sort of small bootstrapped companies. They don't have a lot of money and a lot of advertising behind them. And from what I can tell, the code quality behind both is also very good. I've only looked at the code for PostgraphQL, but yeah. I've heard very good things about Hazura. And from reading the, the technical specs and such about it, it seems quite good. Um, I think the main difference between the two is how deeply integrated they are into the Postgres database. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know that one, one take is better than the other. But it seems to me that PostgraphQL is very deeply integrated into PostgreSQL, um, where, whereas Hazura sort of takes the stance of most people are not going to use the deep advanced features that PostgreSQL offers, and instead they're, want, they're going to want to handle things like user management and authentication outside of your data database. Okay. Um, Hazura provides uh, some kind of a graphical user interface yeah, for you to yeah. manage users, for you to manage roles and permissions. And they make it very nice and very accessible for you to see how all this uh, metadata is managed in a way. Okay. Um, but the downside is then you have to deal with two different stores of information, or maybe even more than that. By contrast, uh, PostGraph file allows you to manage users and roles and permissions and everything inside of Postgres itself. Uh, there's no separate system that you need to work with, but that also means that there's no graphical user interface for managing this stuff. Yeah. It's expected that if you have different user accounts and those user accounts need to have uh, permissions so that one user cannot see another user's data, then you use features like uh, sessions within PostGraph file to set a local session variable to define which user is accessing the database at that time. Okay. And you use the row level security feature to specify that when a query is performed in the context of a user, that query will only return information that that user is able to see. To see yeah. So you have all of this advanced information baked right into Postgres. And Hazura doesn't use that, but Postgres does. Yeah. Uh, so that um, when we were discussing, yeah, it's, it's a really an interesting way of uh, uh, describing that. When we were discussing the um, these um, Postgraphile um, and like how it will make the life easier for, let's say, a front end developer that just want to spin off a project and mm -hmm. that want to think about the back end and boom, they have something to work on so they can plug on top of it maybe a, an Apollo client or whatever um, uh, other client, GraphQL clients to, to, to fetch the data. Um, one of the things that, that, came, that came in mind to me was like, uh, they still need to design their database, right? So, but when I see the the, the skill set of software engineer today, they do less and less database related stuff. Like it's like no, um, that we have a DBA, someone 
focus so we have a, a david a bob gold and an admin admin so that, that's a dba that's <laughs> <laughs> you got that one <laughs> uh, so we had we have a, a dba that does that so i don't have to deal with it but now with these a tool like uh, post graphile that needs to do the, the, the database have you ever um um don't you think that's probably a blocking point for people like to use graphile um like, yes and no um i see your point i see how there's more and more specialization happening these days mm -hmm. and how it makes it harder for people to consider other parts of the stack but at the same time the point of specialization is to get more advanced knowledge in a specific topic. It's not to avoid knowledge from other topics. Other topic, yeah. If you don't know about databases, that's fine, but it is your professional duty as a software developer to at least understand what you don't know and to talk to the people who do know mm. so that you can get their opinion on it. Okay. If, your, if your perspective is, I don't need to know about the databases, I can hand it all off to my DBA who does know, then fine, great but talk to your DBA. Yeah. Ask your DBA about the problem that you're dealing with and make sure that the way that you're solving it on the front end reflects the needs of the database on the back end. Because this should not be two different skill sets that are pulling in opposite directions. This should be two different intelligent people working with each other to find a solution that works for both of them. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, because I, I just felt like... a. a an easier approach will have been to say, okay, there is a database we can plug. You can plug a, 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 a PostgreSQL file on top of it and then get a schema. Then you, there you go. You can you can start working on a thing. But there is the other way around that could be write your schema, and we're going to generate the database from from the schema. Is that something possible? Uh, that is possible. Oh, um, okay. Well, at, well, let me think about that for a minute, actually, yeah. before giving you the wrong answer. Um, it is entirely possible to, in the planning stages of your project, start by writing your GraphQL schema and then say, okay, based on the needs of the schema, we need to structure the database like this to make this schema possible. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of designing your code, to look at all the requirements at the beginning and to make sure that your actual application reflects those requirements. Yep. But if you're asking about, can the front-end developer write the schema and then hand it off to, let's say, PostgraphFile, and PostgraphFile will build your database for you? No, it's not designed to do that. Okay. Um, I believe the idea is that when your data is stored in your database, uh, PostgraphFile or Hazura or whatever tool you're using will try to generate for you the GraphQL structure that fits most closely with the yep. data in your database. But one of the core ideas of GraphQL is that the structure of your query language, the structure of your GraphQL API, does not need to map one-to-one -to, -one to the structure of your database. It's okay for things to be different. Yep. And uh, PostgraphFile explicitly supports that. PostgraphFile allows you to customize the way that the, that the GraphQL API is created so that it doesn't have to reflect directly what is in your database. You can okay. customize it in all sorts of different ways, and that's intentional. So when you're starting from the definition of the GraphQL API that you want, then you do need to take an additional planning step and figure out, okay, based on this API that we want, how should we structure the data in the database? What makes the most sense for the database? What makes the most sense for the API level? Because okay. they're similar, but not the same. Interesting. Okay, I, I understand that. Okay, let me let me ask you, I have a few more questions. Um, you, I, I, I can see the, the, the way you approach things mm -hmm. to be like more open, let's community, get the community involved. Um, you you had uh, I'm going a little bit outside of computer science now. Like we, uh, you were on on Twitter at some point, and then you move onto Mastodon or all these um, right. uh, uh, related platforms. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to I want to have a broader view of your view on, mm -hmm. on, on, on this world and and why did you make that move and how does that uh, com comply with your way of living. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Ultimately, I think it comes down to we design the world that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is a very broad statement and a statement that might not be immediately obvious how it's relevant here, but let me explain. Um, social media has come under a lot of fire recently yep. in terms of large companies that are operating in ways that its users don't like. Facebook has repeatedly betrayed the trust of its users by leaking sensitive information either accidentally through uh, data leaks or intentionally to large governments in ways that its users don't expect and don't want. Yeah. Uh, Twitter has come under fire quite a lot, especially for everything happening with Donald Trump, with all sorts of uh, leaders of the free world that are posting things on Twitter that are very hateful. And Twitter doesn't want to do anything about it. Twitter has also shut down its APIs to, to third-party developers, which is ironic considering that third-party developers were how Twitter got popular in the first place. Uh, Tumblr recently changed its stance on pornography and went from being pro-pornography to attempting to shut it out of its platform entirely. And that caused a huge uproar online in terms of creators who were using Tumblr who felt that this was their their platform, their place to put whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, Tumblr, the company, was changing the rules yep. on what the users perceived was as their platform. Yep. So... The, sh the shift that I'm starting to see these days is that large companies are exerting more control and especially exerting control in ways that users don't like. And the question really is, what are you going to do about it? You know, uh, there's a lot of people who every time Facebook makes any sort of change that they don't like, they say, I'm going to quit Facebook. And then they come back a week later. Um, <laughs> and Facebook, the company, knows that this happens, and they plan for it. Yeah. And they expect that every time they release a, a, uh, a new feature that some people don't like, they're going to see a drop in user engagement, followed by coming back to its baseline. And I understand why people do that. They do that because it's easy to use these tools that companies have designed to be easy to use. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we create the world that we want to live in. If you keep on going back to a social media provider, even after they betray your trust again and again and again, you are creating a world where it's okay for people to betray your trust. Yep. By contrast, I would prefer to create a world where people are more in control of the personal information that they post online. And social media to me is some of the most personal information that you post online. It's information about who you are, what you care about, what you're doing, what you want to do, what you want to achieve. It's information about your friendships, your professional relationships, yeah. information about your photographs, your videos, the things that you care about. That's incredibly personal. And the fact that we are callously handling, handing all of this personal information out to companies, knowing that they will use this information against us to data mine us and use it to try to serve advertising that surveils us and tracks us and tries to find out more about who we are and what we want, I don't like that. That's not the world that I want to live in. Um, and so I recently found out about an open source project called Mastodon. Uh, Mastodon is attempting to resolve a lot of these issues and it's doing so in a way that I find works very well with my principles. Uh, Mastodon is a federated social network. Federated in this case means that different parts of the network are isolated from each other but can talk to each other if they want to. Uh, the best way to think of it is like email. If you have an email account with Gmail and your friend has an email account with Yahoo or another friend has an email account with Hotmail or whatever, yeah. all of these email addresses can still send and receive emails with each other. You don't all have to be on the same platform. Indeed. All of them speak the same language. They all speak email. And so you can federate with each other. You can send emails to other people on the same platform or on different ones. It literally doesn't matter. Yep. Mastodon works exactly the same way. Anyone can set up their own Mastodon instance and they can set their own rules on that instance as well. So you can have a Mastodon instance that is family friendly and does not allow pornography. And you can have another person set up their own Mastodon instance that is all about the pornography. It's yeah. all about sharing dirty photos. Yeah. And both of those are fine. And then the different Mastodon instances can decide how they want to work with each other. 
If you have a third Mastodon instance, which is open to everyone, and there's no rules respecting pornography whatsoever, maybe both of those two instances I talked about before are happy to federate with that third neutral instance. But the two of them that have totally opposing views don't want to federate with each other. Yeah. And the administrators of each instance on the network can set these rules about who's allowed to talk with who. And I think that's great. And then you, you, have, you need to have an account on all of them. I mean, it, it, where you want to be, obviously. No, on. you only need to have, have one Mastodon account. Oh. And then, Just like then, you don't need to have different email addresses on different providers. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I missed that part, indeed. So, um, for example, the largest Mastodon instance, the one that was sort of the start of all of this, uh, is at the URL mastodon.social. Mm -hmm. It's http.www.mastodon.social. There, there's yeah. no .com or anything at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, mastodon.social is a general purpose Mastodon instance, and that's the one where I have my account. But there's thousands of other Mastodon instances okay. out there. And even despite that, even though there are thousands out there, I only need that one account at Mastodon.social. And I can see what's going on at all of these other instances, as long as they haven't blocked communication with the instance that I'm on. Okay, interesting. Uh, there is this, uh, this project um, called um, Alternative, Social Alternative, or okay. you know that thing? I it's, not, it's, um, no. It, um, a website that lists all the art, uh, like alternative tools you can use. Oh, yeah, alternative2.com, I think it is, but I'm not sure. It's, uh, I think at the end, yeah, mm -hmm. it's something alternative. So they sure. show you the, uh, the alternative for Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook, yeah. and all these, all these tools from uh, even like Slack and like they literally show you like yeah. you can you can hone your own you can hone your data you can yes. hone your the you can exactly. build the world you want by go by choosing those things because mm -hmm. they won't track you they won't um, um, you know play with your data or sell your data because guess what you own them yeah you you, you own them so mm -hmm. yeah interesting um, yeah. and actually that reminds me there's another thing that I find really inst interesting about the Mastodon ecosystem as well which is that the data is designed to be portable mm -hmm. um, and by that I mean not only that other Mastodon instances can communicate with whatever instance you're on but other other uh, social media that speaks the same language can do so as well mm. so for example there's a project called pixel fed you can think of pixel fed as the mastodon version of instagram it's about posting images mm -hmm. but doing so in a way that is free and open source and is not uploading all of your information to facebook which owns instagram um, nice. what's interesting about pixel fed and mastodon is they can speak with each other they speak the same language, language yeah. which means that if you have a friend who primarily uploads pictures on pixel fed and you prefer text using Mastodon, you can follow each other on both platforms. When your friend uploads pictures, you can get a, an entry in your Mastodon feed saying, hey, your friend just uploaded something on yeah. PixelFed. Click here if you want to see it. Uh, how many times have you wanted to follow your Twitter friends on Facebook or been able to talk with your Telegram friends on WhatsApp? Right now, you cannot do that. Yeah. You cannot do that because all of these companies forbid it because they don't speak the same language. Indeed. But the nice thing about using these open source alternatives is they all speak a similar language. Uh, I believe it's, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of this uh, of this system, but it's it's some sort of simple pubs, uh, publish subscribe system that allows many different software systems that speak it to communicate with each other seamlessly. I don't, I, I, I'm trying to find out the name I of wonder. the, the name of the, 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 that thing. Yeah. It's, I'm, we're not talking about pubs up here. No. no. Wait, um, uh, okay. I don't know how long it's going to take me to find it. So I'm, I'm <laughs> not going to spend a whole lot of time on it right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, no, there is a whole movement out there and um, that basically supported that idea of going to finding all those alternative and, and, and obviously, um, uh, building your entire ecosystem with those uh, those things and yeah. uh, the federation part is it's uh, it's probably the most important part there. Yeah. And there are others that are built on top of the of the blockchain to also use 
the, the capability of these this technology but uh, um yeah I, I didn't see like i haven't seen much of those tools but yeah i heard about uh, mastodon mm -hmm. uh, for a while now uh so yeah it's uh, thanks for sharing that 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 point of view sure. i mean your your view on this um because i think a lot of people are um in this like like they have this question is like yeah how can i get rid of facebook or or twitter uh, these kind of tools and yeah because they have probably a huge follower base or they they have like deep conversation with people already yeah. there but they still feel like oh in and out and yeah there are, there are alternative on the market um, social networks are sticky you know the yeah. more people you have on a social network the harder it is to yeah, leave indeed and that's another reason incidentally why companies don't want their social networks to federate with others because if it was easy to leave facebook for another yeah. platform a lot of people would would yeah um so ultimately it comes down to deciding how your morals and your ethics balance with your desire to be able to connect with your friends online. Okay. Personally, I've decided that I want to encourage people to use open source alternatives, to use Mastodon or PixelFed or whatever system they want to use. And if they don't, I can continue reading their posts on Twitter or on Facebook if they're public. But, you know, I, I don't want to be a part of that system personally. Yeah. And so I won't. Yeah, I'm um, not I, going to, I, I, yeah, I only have a Twitter. Um, like Facebook was I was just using it for uh, business related stuff, mm -hmm. and I even wrote on my my Facebook like, "Don't send your friend requests. This is just for like business stuff because I, I I don't like I have no friends there, and mm -hmm. this is just uh, because I needed an account to manage uh, companies uh, pages. But yeah. then at the end, yeah, yeah." and it's not really needed so yeah thanks for sharing that let me go back to open source sure uh workshop and uh, and being a speaker right mm -hmm. so let me let me put it this way you you uh, you met a lot of people in the the open source world and those people are putting they obviously so some of them are trying to be fully uh, engage in a project, meaning that working probably full time, two three days per week, on the thing, meaning that they needs money to mm -hmm. get to be able to focus on those amazing tools. Um, what what are the models you saw out there that can sustain that, that can help those people work that way, and what are the pros and cons of those models? Sure. Um, so the first model that people usually reach for in the open source world is a simple donation based model yep. where you provide everything for free and you hope that people will pay you for it. This usually doesn't work very well, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish that it did, but people just, people will not give you money unless you, unless they feel they're getting something for it in return. So for a donation based model, you're not going to make very much money off of that. It's not going to be actually sustainable. It's more like putting out a tip jar and hoping that someone gives you a bit. Yeah. Um, a model that actually works, which is the model that Benji is trying to use for PostgreSQL, is more of a sponsorship model, or a situation where you give the code away for free, but you charge people for support. Uh, you charge people for building custom functionality on their oh, behalf. Okay. Yeah. So there are a couple of companies out there that are currently using PostgreSQL in production. And as far as I know, they are they are paying a, a sponsorship sponsorship subscription uh, to Benji's company, and okay. in exchange, they get several benefits such as preferred support. Uh, they get Benji's assistance with uh, providing expert information on the best way to use this tool. And if they find that the tool is missing features and functionality, Benji will build it for That's them. That's a nice one. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. So it works out very well because it incentivizes companies to actually use these tools and to find out where the rough edges are and to get those rough edges improved. But it means that you have a situation where a company feels the need to pay for an open source project. Money and open source are not mutually exclu exclusive, yeah. even though a lot of people seem to feel that they should be. A lot of people seem to feel that paying for a product that you could get for free is wrong, and I don't understand that. <laughs> I don't know who who taught engineers or uh, software developers like free is good. 
like a lot of people just go like it's free i'm going for the free one but guess what there is a paid version yeah there is a paid version there is a word paid mm -hmm. in there yeah that's not good uh, yeah it's 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 difficult and then like you um there is this heart rage people be like hey there is a platform to organize your event your activities and how much does that cost five euro per month it's like no we're gonna find an alternative but for the same five euros you get all this benefit to support yeah. and yeah i mean anyway. i like to say when you're when you're dealing with these open source projects that are very difficult and complicated to set up yeah it's free to use but only if the value of your time is zero you know mm -hmm. if you're going to spend hours days weeks getting this set up then you have to consider the cost of your time yep. as well mm -hmm. and it's often more advantageous just to spend the money to get someone to help you out yep. with setting this up properly Okay. So those are two funding models that I talked about, donation-based, which doesn't work, sponsorship, which I think usually does if you can find the people willing to pay for it. But there are other models out there as well. Um, there's a couple of companies out there that are trying to provide more funding for open source projects. Mm -hmm. And the one that I am really in support of right now is a company called Tidelift, tidelift.com. Oh, tidelift. Okay. Um, and the idea behind Tidelift is that there's a lot of big enterprise companies out there that are using open source and don't even necessarily realize the risks that are involved in doing so. If they are running their software on a foundation of open source software, and then it turns out that one of those projects in that foundation has a security vulnerability, then it could be that there's nobody maintaining that project. Mm. And it could be that your critical enterprise system is going to have this huge gaping vulnerability because that because the open source community isn't being funded well enough to get people to maintain the software that is so crucial yeah. for business development these days. So. What Tidelift is trying to do is they are selling subscriptions to large enterprise businesses and they take the money that they earn from those subscriptions and they give back, I think, 80% or 90%, something like that, to the open source developers open source, yeah. that maintain that code. And the way that they calculate who gets what is for every company that buys a subscription, the company then does a, a dependency analysis with Tidelift. So the Tidelift is able to see which open source packages that company is actually using mm, in okay. that product. And then the more an open source package is actually used by a paying customer, the more money the maintainer of that package would receive from Tidelift. Okay, so I'm signed up as a, a lifter, as they call it, on Tidelift. And I earn a small amount of money, I think right now it's about 20 US dollars a month, uh, to maintain a couple of packages that are actually used by enterprise companies. And there's not a lot of work that goes into that. Mostly it involves being available in case there's some sort of security vulnerability that comes up. And writing change logs and being able to provide good information when there's an update to the package so that people who are running the software are, they know what they're doing mm -hmm. when it comes to updating their open source dependencies. All of that is stuff that a good maintainer should be doing anyway. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know about that company. That's yeah. an interesting model. At Hackages, we were thinking about, we were, because we weren't able to, uh, to apply that. Like we um, to have like a bucket where engineers just say, okay, every month I'm gonna put twenty euro on the bucket, and then we decide where that bucket goes. And and uh, but that goes back to yeah, donation, not exactly. really like um, it's an idea like tight lift. It's a brilliant idea. Exactly. Actually. And I mean, there are a couple of companies that do care about open source and will have this bucket of money approach that you're describing. Yeah. But the thing, the, the biggest problem with the bucket of money approach is that it usually allows the money to go to the well-known dependencies while missing out on yeah. the smaller ones. That have actually um, a, huge, a huge impact because exactly. uh, they also use within the big one. Exactly, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the way that the tide lift funding model works it actually incentivizes people to write code that is used, even if that code is not very well known. Yeah, so indeed. if there's a small transitive dependency that's used by 20 different big name projects, then that transitive dependency is still going to get a fair amount of money because it's actually used by these enterprise companies that are buying subscriptions. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, 
yeah, I also saw Microsoft that started uh, like a GitHub. I say Microsoft, but it's GitHub. Mm-hmm. Uh, GitHub that started that sponsorship yes. model as well. GitHub Sponsors is also very similar. Um, <coughs> GitHub Sponsors is one of the... Uh, it's sort of like the Patreon model, the the sponsorship model yeah, Patreon, um, yeah. of allowing companies to say, I want to sponsor development of this project and I will get something in return for doing that. Yeah, interesting. Um, maybe what you get in return is simply a mention in the project readme which counts as advertising and for a lot of companies that's very important or maybe you get some sort of uh enterprise support uh some sort of preferred support uh maybe you get someone who is well known in the project when maybe the project developer answering your questions directly instead of having to go through stack overflow or github issues okay so it doesn't need to be a lot that people get for a sponsorship but People usually want something in exchange for giving you their money every month. Nice. Okay, DB, look, we have a few minutes. Okay. And there are two topics that I haven't touched on. Mm -hmm. You being a singer, and I want you to hypnotize me, like (laughs) right now, today. That should work. If it doesn't work, I won't believe that. So no, that we don't do. But can you tell me, like... Uh, the, the hypnotherapy thing. How did you get into that? And then the, the singing. Uh, so with the hypnosis thing, it's something that I've been interested in for about as long as I can remember. Uh, and when I went off to college, as I said, I double majored in computer science and psychology. Yeah. I would have done a specialization in hypnosis if my school had offered that, but instead I sort of had to figure it out on my own. Um, something about the idea of uh, people opening up and being able to talk about things that are very difficult for them and also helping them to get around issues and mental blocks was very appealing to me. And I like hypnosis because it's one of those things that is really interesting both to to work with people and to experience them. And also, it's just a fun topic to talk about at parties. When yeah. I tell people that I'm a hypnotist, they're like, whoa, that's so cool. Um, I, think, I think Zara had the same reaction, like, you can't do that. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, people have a lot of misconceptions about hypnosis. Uh, people think that it's this really weird alien thing that only a couple of things can, only a couple of people can do. I'm one of those people who think that. Well, let me give you a little bit more information about hypnosis. Uh, All that it is, is a state of highly focused attention. And when you're in that state of mind, it changes a little bit how your brain works. Uh, It changes how you're able to take in new information and synthesize that information with everything that you already know. Programmers actually are very familiar with the state of mind. A lot of people call it flow. The flow, yeah. Yeah, when you're in that flow state of mind, it makes it really easy for you to focus on this one project that you're working on and block out everything else. And it allows you to take in all sorts of information about what you're seeing, synthesize it, and use it to to build new conclusions. People talk about using hypnosis to change people's minds, but the reality is people are changing their minds constantly all the time. It's a process called learning. When you learn new information, you are by definition changing your mind about something that you didn't know and now you know a little bit more about. So hypnosis is simply a process of taking people into that state of mind, making it easier for them to synthesize information with the help of someone who's guiding them towards a specific purpose and getting them around or through a block that they might have had in their past. Okay. Another I example that I like to use for describing hypnosis, uh, especially when it comes to all those things that you might have seen with like clucking like a chicken up on stage. Uh, so that is called yeah, yeah. a suggestion when it comes to hypnosis. And it's called a suggestion because it's not a command. You are suggesting to someone that they consider a new idea or an idea they already knew from a different perspective. Uh, And this happens actually when you go to the movies and you watch a really good movie. Uh, You know that what you're watching is actors standing in front of a set while reading from a script. But if it's a good movie, you're willing to suspend your disbelief and you're willing to say, this doesn't feel like actors, this feels like a real storyline. And it starts to get your emotions involved as well. You start feeling like this is something that you want to go along with, even though you know intellectually that it's sort of fake, but that doesn't bother you in the moment. So similarly, that that classic idea of being hypnotized to cluck like a chicken, uh, that usually happens in a stage hypnosis show where the hypnotist has asked for volunteers from the audience and stressed that, okay, you're going to come up on stage and we're all going to have a really good time. We're going to laugh. We're gonna, it's going to be great. You're going to provide a lot of entertainment. 
And so when the hypnotist gets these people into this really focused state of mind, gets them really interested in exploring new ideas, then when he says, I want you to be a chicken on stage for a while, it's not that the person under hypnosis literally believes they are chicken. It's more along the lines of, well, hmm, I've never really been a chicken before, but I wonder how I would act if I were. Mm -hmm. How would I sound? How would I move? This is interesting. You know, normally I would just brush this idea off, but because I'm in this really focused state of mind, it's captured my attention. And now I think I'm going to try acting like a chicken just because it sounds kind of fun right now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get it notized now? <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm gonna have like tons of follow-up questions on that, but good, please guess, do. Guess, guess what? We we have just a few few a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, here is the thing: uh, when we uh, you uh, we also mentioned that you you're a singer, mm -hmm. so you're part of a, like a chorus here in Amsterdam yes. as well. So uh, where did you start with that and? How, what is it really? Yeah, well, I've been singing for most of my life. It's a great way for me to feel that I express myself and to feel connected with the things around me okay. and the people around me. Um, when I was living in Boston, I used to sing with the Boston Gay Men's Chorus. Yeah. And when I moved to Amsterdam, I wanted to find community. I wanted to find people to hang out with. And so I joined the Amsterdam Gay Men's Chorus as you well. You find the same, they have the same... Uh, like, uh, well, gay men's a... choruses exist all around the world. Oh, okay. uh, they started okay, in San Francisco back in the 70s and 80s, yeah. and they've really spread globally. Um, most big cities all around the world will have some sort of gay men's chorus in them. Nice. And it's a great way, as I said, of meeting people, forming communities. And when I travel to different cities, sometimes I even check and see if I can drop in on a rehearsal of their local chorus, just because nice. I'm curious. Wow. So you literally have it like all around the world and you do perform here lately you perform actually yeah last month uh actually just a couple of weeks ago i found out that i got a solo for one of the songs in my chorus oh, so i'm wow. very excited about that very nice. uh we're having a performance at on december 14th uh it's in the polanen theater in uh it's near Westerpark in amsterdam i believe okay uh if you want to learn more you can go to the website it's amsgmc.nl yeah. that's for amsterdam Gay Men's Chorus, GMC. Put it out, yeah. Yep. Okay, very interesting. So, yeah. Uh, DB, part of the, the ActFlix uh, journey, like we, uh, today I'm, I, I invited you, we're having this nice talk, and I'm grateful that you 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 here. Mm -hmm. We, uh, one of the things we're trying to build over time uh, is to, to create this, this uh, link between the guest and the people out there that inspire them to do good in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think through the, your work, I'm not talking only about open source, but the workshop you gave, um, the, the talks you gave, most of them usually are for free, but you're actually educating people and helping them get better. Mm -hmm. you, obviously, um, you obviously inspire people, help them grow, and then you grew or, uh, as well as a human being. And those people will look at you like, that guy inspired me. Do you, you have anyone out there that inspire you in your daily life to do good, to be whoever you are? Is, is there, is, is, uh, do you have such a person? And if that person does exist, would you be willing to host a podcast? You hosting a podcast with that person sitting cross table. So there are two questions and you have it. <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, there were a lot of people in the open source community that I have looked up to quite a lot over mm. the years, um, mostly in the Python community, to be honest, because that is where I've had most of my professional experience. Uh, so Armin Ronasher, uh, who goes by the username Mitsuhiko online. Uh, he was the one who created the Flask framework in Python, and yeah. he's been a huge inspiration for me over the years. Nice. Um, a lot of the people that I've met as part of the Django Foundation as well. Um, 
but I mean, these days I'm trying to move more into the JavaScript world and it's a little bit hard for me to find technical role models in that area just because everything in JavaScript is moving so quickly. It's so hard to actually, <laughs> you know, find stability there. Yeah, that's is, true. That's a whole other topic that we yeah, can discuss as indeed, well. Indeed. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to come up with specific names that I can give you, and I think at the moment I'm just turning up a blank. Can I come back to you later on that? Because okay. I okay. am interested. I just, you know, sometimes having a question off the top of but your head. You, okay, yeah. but you mentioned already uh, one name. Yeah, uh, I can I can try to contact Armin for sure. Yeah, but no worries. We going to get them around here. Okay. If if you say that person is this, that exact person, I need to talk the person to the camera directly here mm -hmm. and invite them here. And you know what? Once they watch it, they're gonna come. Well, they might. Yeah. Who knows? So you, you are we going with um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Armin Ron Ronasher. Are believe. we going with him? Yeah. You're sure? Yeah, he's a good guy. Okay. Uh, wh where does he live? Ah, uh, I I think he lives somewhere in, in the world. Yeah, he lives in like Sweden or one of those Scandinavian See, that's countries. A, that, those are neighbors, so it's easy to, <laughs> to get. <laughs> it's easy to get them around. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Is the, so we 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 almost done. Usually, we l just let you have the closing words and whatever you want to share with uh, the community and people listening. It's all okay. yours. Um, well, I'm going to start with a shameless plug for myself, <laughs> okay, okay. which is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a freelancer yeah. and I'm always looking for interesting companies that are looking yeah. for someone who wants to help them out. Yeah. So if you think you might be interested in bringing me on to take a contract, to help out with a project or even doing some mentoring and training for your company, I'd be happy to do that. Great. Um, but yeah. Uh, after that, I just want to say it's been really great connecting with the technical community here in Amsterdam, meeting more interesting people. As I said, I've been trying to go to more meetups and I want to organize more technical talks and such on my own. Um, coming to the Netherlands has been a really great experience, but also being an expat is kind of isolating. And I'm trying to find ways to build community more. So if anyone else also wants that same sort of thing, to try to build more community in terms of technical expertise and people who are interested in all sorts of crazy off the wall things like hypnosis and singing, <laughs> please get in touch with me because Great. I'm a really friendly guy and nice. I like finding people who are interested in the same sort of things. Yeah, I can, I can, I second that. It's an amazing guy. So uh, thanks again, DB, for coming. Um, just for people listening and watching, we had a, we have a, a new podcast uh, uh, on Adflix, and um, DB joined us to talk about open source, GraphQL, and hypnotherapy. Yeah, for some the last five some, minutes. Some some people do that. Yes. Uh, and um, so hopefully you like it. You enjoyed the, the, this podcast. I see you next time and. Have an, a, a wonderful day. Bye, people. Thanks, man. Thank you. <laughs>